Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about a fairly common question, which is if I'm traveling with firearms and I get stopped by the police, either at a traffic ticket, check stop, something like that, what information about these firearms do I have to volunteer to the officer? And what information should I volunteer? And similarly, if the officer wants to look at the firearms, do I have to do that? Should I do that? Let's have a look at this. The first thing I want to clarify is that I'm not talking about a situation like a high risk takedown, something like that, that's going to have a very different dynamic. I'm also not talking about fish and wildlife searches because those are going to vary from province to province and they have a very different sort of set of powers. Fish and wildlife officers typically have way more power than a police officer does at the roadside, at least in terms of these sorts of searches. So the first part of this is what information should I volunteer? Because the officer will come up, they'll ask for your license and registration, which of course you have to provide. You're involved in a regulated activity, but you might be transporting the firearms and they might not be readily visible or the officer might not see them. Do you have to volunteer officer? I have a gun. No, you don't. You are not required to provide that sort of information. Similarly, the officer might ask, do you have any firearms with you? They might ask this, for instance, because you're stopped right on the way to the range, or they just saw you pull out of a gun store, or they might ask this because it's hunting season. You're not required to answer that question. You're just not. You should say, I don't answer questions at the roadside, or I don't want to answer this question without my lawyer, without asking my lawyer first. People ask, well, won't that annoy the officer? And it might, but that's okay. We're okay with that because at the end of the day, you want to preserve your rights. Remember that you start off being innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, which means anything that is coming out of your mouth is worsening your situation. Just as a, a blanket rule, if your mouth is moving, your case, your situation is getting worse. So just keep quiet. You, you have that right. Exercise it. However, often an officer will either see a firearm because it might be, you know, sitting in your back seat, you know, unlocked if it's a non-restricted because the only thing that you're required to do is transport them unloaded and not in a careless fashion. And the officer may say, I want to have a look at that. And people say, should I do that? The answer here is again, fairly simple, is that you don't want to consent to any searches. There's two ways an officer can get to a search really. Uh, either they have some grounds and that may mean that they have a warrant or it may mean that they've got some legal authority that allows them to search regardless of what you want. So that's option number one. They've got some legal power that lets them do this. In that case, they're not going to be asking. They're going to be demanding. Option number two is they don't have that power. So they're going to ask your permission. So if they're asking your permission, it suggests they probably don't have the authority to demand it. They might, in which case, if you refuse, they're just going to fall back on the authority to demand. But most likely they're asking your permission because they don't have the authority to do so. Think about it like your neighbor. Your neighbor is not allowed to take your car, but you can give permission to your neighbor to take your car. And then that makes it okay. Same thing with the officer. You know, if they're not empowered to search your vehicle, that search becomes okay, just perfectly fine if you give permission. So if you end up at a trial later down the road and you have given permission, your legal situation is much weaker because you won't be able to argue that that's a bad search. You want to preserve that legal issue. Now I hear you saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about a trial down the road. That's crazy talk. I'm a responsible gun owner. There's nothing in that gun case or nothing with that firearm that is going to, that's going to bring me to a trial. I'm not worried. I have nothing to hide. And I have nothing to hide is a line that people use that it shows up in criminal files all the time from people who later discovered that they did indeed have something to hide. 
Let's also remember our firearm safety rules. And this is right from the, uh, the Canadian Firearm Safety Program. ACTS, that little uh, acronym as a memory aid. First thing, assume the gun is loaded. Jeff Cooper, who had the same safety rules, but phrased them in a different fashion, says, all guns are always loaded. That's a, that's a firearm safety tip, but it's also a legal safety tip, because when you're contemplating, I have nothing to hide, remember, the, remember that, assume the gun is loaded. And if the gun is loaded, you absolutely have something to hide, because you're going to end up getting charged, you're going to end up... Today might not be your lucky day. Today might be the day, the one in a, you know, one in a thousand, one in a million day that you forget that there's a cartridge in there. Keep in mind as well that those firearm safety rules, you know, the acts, they're built in a fashion that is layered, where you have to screw up with more than one rule being broken before something dangerous is going to happen. And the reason for that is that they assume that there's going to be a mistake at some point. I have seen people who have sworn up and down that they always check that the gun is unloaded, who, when they volunteered to allow a police officer to have a look, that was the day. And the officer might have gone through, you know, 20 firearms, opening the action on each one. They find one cartridge in one firearm, you're getting charged. That's ruined your whole day. You're much happier if the officer never does that. So assume the gun is loaded when you're making this decision. The other thing that gets asked is, what about my gun cases? Do I have to open those? Well, if the officer is demanding, you know, that they, they have a search, you're going to have a question about whether or not you have to or want to open these gun cases. And usually the answer to that is no. But you may want to call a lawyer here. If the officer is asking, say, whoa, 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 I want to talk to a lawyer. And the officer, if they've got, you know, power to search, they may say, I'm not waiting. I'm just going in. I, you know, I've got this authority. Fine. But here's the cost benefit analysis. Your, your case, it might be anywhere from a $20 case to, you know, a $400 case. There's some really nice cases out there. And now you're considering this officer is, if I don't provide the combination or the keys, this officer is going to break the case open. Keep in mind, you're later potentially going to be facing a trial. Potentially. You don't know at this stage whether that is or is not the case. You might be saying, I can gamble on this. I'm pretty sure I'm safe, but you can never be 100% certain. So you may have to consider balancing that. From a legal perspective, it's, you know, just purely looking at this from the perspective of somebody who, you know, does done these cases, done defense work. Your lawyer is always going to be happier if the officer has broken open your cases. The reason for that is that the officer is going to be com pretty much completely unable to argue consent if the case is broken open. Can you imagine that argument? He said I could look in. He said I could search his uh, gun case and then I broke it open anyway. Or but he was unable to provide the combination. Consent at that point is pretty much off the table, which is great. It preserves your legal rights. It preserves your legal arguments. The other thing to remember is that opening the case in and of itself is a little mini confession. You might be saying, whoa, 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 how's that a confession? I'm just doing a thing. Well, you are in doing that thing, providing evidence against yourself. Think about it. Let's say you've got a combination lock on your gun case and you either dial in the combination yourself or you tell the officer, here's the combination. And the officer dials it in and your case pops open. Well, now you have told the officer and later the court, because I guarantee you if there's something wrong, they will use this as evidence against you. This will be showing up in the trial. Now you've shown them that you had the ability to open that case. And that, by extension, it probably suggests that you knew what was in it. That's evidence against you. The Crown's case has gotten better. Your case has gotten worse. Or you might produce a key and hand it over. 
or open it yourself. Depending on how cautious the officer is, they may either be demanding that they can open it or that you do it for them. Uh, however, by producing that key, again, you're showing knowledge. I know this key opens that box. I am in possession of this key. Therefore, I am almost certainly in possession of the stuff inside the case. You've taken an ent entire legal issue essentially off the Crown's plate. You've made their day easier. We don't want to do that. If the officer has to break in, it's a better legal situation for you. However, you're ultimately the person who's bearing the consequences of this. You know, if the cases are broken, they're your cases. Your lawyer's not buying you new cases. If you get charged, they're your charges. Your lawyer will help you with them, but of course they're gonna charge. And at the end of the day, your lawyer is not the one looking at a possible sentence. Your lawyer gets to go home after the, the court case. No matter how bad it goes, your lawyer is going home. Similarly, your lawyer isn't getting a firearm prohibition. So you should talk to a lawyer if, the, or if an officer is asking you to make these choices. But you're going to be the one who makes the decisions. You're going to make, you know, make all of those. All I can tell you is that from the lawyer's perspective, the lawyer who doesn't face any consequences one way or the other, but definitely would prefer to win the case, the lawyer is happier if those cases get broken into. So to sum up, you are not required to answer questions as a general rule. There may be exceptions. Uh, again, this is I can't give you legal advice to your specific situation. You should contact a lawyer if you're in this scenario. But volunteering information is a bad idea. Answering questions is a bad idea. Opening cases is a bad idea. Providing firearms to the officer to make further inspection is a bad idea because while a rifle itself might be in plain view, the contents of that rifle, opening the action, that's not in plain view. That's now we're talking in a different level of search. Preserving your rights at this stage can help you out greatly in terms of avoiding a charge because if the officer never inspects your firearms, they can never find anything wrong. And in terms of winning a trial, I'm also going to give a couple of other examples just to just because I know people may have issue with the whole I am not doing anything wrong. I have seen people charged for transporting a firearm with a snap cap in it. If you don't know what a snap cap is, snap cap is inert dummy ammunition. It doesn't fire, which is used sometimes for dry fire drills. Some people like to keep a snap cap in a firearm just in case. I don't see much point to it, but some people, you know, different strokes for different folks, that sort of thing. I have seen people charged because an officer found a snap cap in it because the officer may not know the difference between a snap cap and live ammunition. I've also seen people charged because brass ejected from a firearm, spent brass. You know, it's already been fired. The bullet is downrange. It's in a berm. It's in a deer somewhere. It's wherever it landed. And all that's left is just the brass casing and the spent primer. I've seen people charged for that. Ultimately, they get acquitted, but I'm sure they would have been a lot happier if the officer had never made that inspection and never laid those charges because it would have been a lot cheaper for them. So consider those possibilities as well. I hope you've enjoyed this content. I hope you found it educational. Once again, if you did, please like, share, and subscribe. It does help the channel grow. I really do appreciate it. Thank you again. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time, and I hope you've been armed with some knowledge here.